a reminder, we have a clothing collection downstairs. If you have clothes that you want to get rid of that are usable, I'll bring them down. Uh, the 31st at night. Okay, uh, Easter's in March this year, and we'll have the early service at 9.30, followed by the breakfast. Uh, that's March 31st. Let's do our verses together. Uh, the elder the of the elect lady, lady and, and her, her children, children whom I love, love the truth, and not I only, but only, but also all they that have, have known the truth, for the, the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. All right, let's sing our first hymn together. Uh, Burdens are the fit of Then they took him, led him, and brought him into the high priest's house. Peter followed them far off. When they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid behold him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked up upon him, upon him and said, This man also was with him. And he denied 
him, saying, Woman, know him, I know him not. And after a little while, another man, another saw him and said, Thou art also that with them, or of them. And Peter said, uh, I am not. And about the space of an hour and a half, another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, This fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spoke, the cock, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. May God bless as we look at this portion of the scripture this morning. Let's continue to pray for uh, some of our folks that are still out um, and some that are still here. Uh, we'll pray for Louise who made it today. She's feeling a little better, right? That's good. And uh, pray for Jimmy and his kids and for Gerard and his ongoing needs. Pray for Dylan in school and uh, he seems to be going through some spiritual crisis and uh, so let's pray for him. Um, Pray for Jared as he continues to go back and forth to the city and eventually he'll be um, staying in Florida. Pray for Justine and she's been sick and other things. So pray for her. That's why we haven't seen her in a while. Um, pray for Alan and Janet and their family and um, for um, the family there. And pray for Matt and Mary. Um, I was over the Matt and Mary's the other day, so Mary seems to be doing better. And uh, but they didn't know and don't know what's wrong with her. So that's always an encouraging thing. You see three different doctors with three different opinions. Um, she did have a bleed, and uh, they they haven't zeroed in on it yet. But she seems to be getting around. So pray for them, uh, Keith and Elaine. Keith is here, so continue to pray for him as he goes through. Um, uh, takes voice lessons. He's gonna. <laughs> I gotta speak louder, Keith. Okay. All right. Just that. Just won't ask him to sing, Chester. No. Uh, don't we're gonna have a duet. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pray for uh, Elaine, who's uh, still under the weather and on uh, medication. So pray for her and uh, Stefan in the back. If you don't get a chance to look at it, there's a. Uh, um, there. January prayer letter and information about uh, all that's happening with them and uh, I'd like to be able to say something about Jonathan other than let's continue to pray for him but I haven't heard from him in a few months and uh, okay anybody on prayer list okay praise the Lord the the uh, Puxley County Phil said we're going to have an early spring six weeks I looked on the calendar, exactly six weeks is um, spring. <laughs> so that's the big joke of it. But we've been to Puxatani, not on Groundhog Day, but it's uh, they have millions, of, uh, millions, thousands of people to go. Wouldn't go to church, but they'll go and uh, worship some kind of rat. <laughs> anyway. All right, let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity, um, you know, to come to worship you. And that's why we're here. I pray that everybody is on the same uh, page with me as far as uh, worshiping you and the, the reality of all that. And we we uh, pray not because it's just symbolic or because it's part of the uh, church set um, church uh, liturgy or whatever you want to call it, but we pray with confidence, knowing that you're concerned about us, and uh, not only that, you know everything about us and everything that's going to happen to us and. Uh, you know everything more than us, and so we get confidence to come before you because that's uh, something that was granted to us because of salvation. And uh, you are the great physician. You can heal. You can restore. And uh, yet, Lord, we know that in reality, sometimes we have to bear uh, the difficulties and uh, just uh, live, uh, continue on no matter how we feel and uh, what goes on, Father, because we, we know it's part of your perfect will. We pray, Father, for our church family. We pray and continue to pray for Louise. She makes the adjustment to be by herself and 
all the different things that go on with her health, Lord, that you would just continue to bless her. Pray for Jimmy and uh, as he tries to encourage his children to attend church and uh, Jared as well. Pray for him and his health needs and for Dylan. We pray, Lord, that you would just uh, lead someone into his life that could uh, help him. Uh, I know that he's been um, suggested to a psychiatrist or something along those lines, but I wasn't too keen on that. But Father, we pray, Lord, that you would just uh, uh, guide and direct his steps. We pray for uh, Jared and <clears throat> opportunities for him as he moves to Florida. Pray for Justine that she would get on the mend. And uh, we pray for Al and Janet and their family, Father, that you would just continue to bless them. Pray for Matt and Mary, and uh, especially for uh, Sue and for Travis, Father, that you would just uh, work in their lives. We pray for uh, Keith and Elaine, and that we pray that Keith and Elaine would be restored to us soon. And we continue to pray for Chester as he's on the mend. And uh, for Miriam, Father, that you would continue to bless her in Brazil and uh, that you would just be with Ronnie as well. Pray for Stefan and Rebecca as they uh, travel over the country, sharing their burden for Peru, Lord, that you would bless them and they would be able to raise the support and the out and passage. And for Jonathan as well, as he serves in Japan. We're thankful for them and we're thankful for this time. We give you the praise in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> years now here. It seems just like yesterday, Margaret and I moved here, and you got, it's been 13 years to get used to me. And that's a difficult task to try to get used to somebody like me. And uh, the only redeeming value is my wife sitting there. But uh, we, and churches all over the world now, are taking the time to celebrate the Lord's table and the significance of it. There's no magic. There's no saving grace. It's just a, a, a fact that as believers, we all share the same uh, origin originality as far as our salvation in Christ. I'm going to ask Jimmy to pray for them. Right? Father in heaven, Father, we just thank you, Father, for this time to come together and celebrate the table, Father. And we just pray, Father, if there's anybody out there that knows not Christ, that today would be the day of salvation. We pray, and we just pray for your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Now Paul was given this by the Lord and says, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Sing one more hymn together. You may be made seated. Christ the Lord.
consider the narrative uh, where Peter denies the Savior. In any reading, scripture reading, there's always a goal to understand how it applied in the first century. What did the people understand? And uh, what was the context? And all that uh, as it unraveled before us. We have the privilege of the scriptures before us and the accuracy of the scriptures based on the Holy Spirit's ministry 
and inspiration so we can have confidence to know that what is given to us is exactly what God wants us to know, even though we uh, are left with questions sometimes of the logistics of how this all transpired. Questions that uh, arise uh, from the passages really are, uh, are helps for us as we consider uh, not just the truth of the passage, but um, how it applies to us on our and the basis that we have today. But let's have a word of prayer together first before we start. Father, we're thankful for this time. Lord, we pray as the minutes tick by uh, that we might have the ability to uh, totally focus on this section, Father. And we, uh, we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess the best way to start is uh, right from the beginning. Because uh, usually uh, someone that uh, denies or rejects a person, it's not something that just happens like that. It's something that gradually happens. Now, in this case, we understand that Christ already told him that he was going to deny uh, the Savior. That was, you know, that was something that we are privileged to know. Um, and whether Peter understood it or not, because Peter was the one that said, I'm ready to die for you. And uh, so uh, even... Even though Peter goes through this difficulty, uh, he comes out better at the end, obviously. And uh, we're going to look at the passage and see. So I, the first thing I want to look at is the prelude to the denial. If you drop back to verse 31 of the same chapter, you'll see what I just was mentioning here. And, uh, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Now remember, Peter's name was Simon. Peter's name was Peter. Uh, he was also called Cephas. So when you see these, you can kind of say, well, Cephas is Aramaic, Peter's Peter, and, you know, so you have to kind of look, but they're all the same guy, and usually the context will tell you whether it's someone else or not, but Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that, you may, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, I've seen others people, other people's translations of this passage, uh, including my own effort. And there's the possibility that the, the idea is that Satan is there to sift you or have you all to sift. So uh, in this case, in this context, we're looking at Peter. But Satan certainly was out there to uh, do a number on anybody he could. But in this case, it's Peter at this time. And uh, sifting you like we, I guess you could take that two different ways. Normally when you sift anything, you're trying to get stuff out of the mix. Um, I've helped my grandfather and my uncle over the years, and maybe even Keith, sift uh, dirt to get a better grade for making cement. I think that's what we were doing anyway. I was just doing what I was told. <laughs> if it even is in the context with Keith. But I remember doing it as a kid because we had a sift thing. Uh, but um, you, can, you can look at that word as an other way too because um, in the mineral categories, uh, what they would do is take gold and melt it and then drag off the dross, the non-pure part of it, and then the end result is uh, a pure grade of, of um, gold. So in this case, when you look at this, the sifting as we really the outcome would be better for Peter, but it's a very uncomfortable process. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that we understand that uh, sometimes you have to really uh, go through some difficulties to come out better on the other side physically. And in this case, I think uh, this section really is focusing on Peter's recognition of what he had done and the realization of who Christ is and, and the uh, hope of the future for him that the Lord uses. So Peter's disposition, which is just a fancy word for saying, you know, what was Peter like? Peter was uh, uh, one of the men that uh, was willing to shed blood for others. I mean, he cut off Malchus's ear, uh, and then Jesus had to have, tell him to hold off on the sword. So Peter was kind of uh, um, um, ready to jump the gun sometimes, and that's why he said what he said. Uh, but uh, in the in this section, verse 32, Jesus says, And I pray for thee that thy faith fail not, and, and it, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So the question comes up with the uses of the word conversion. And uh, I think it's a very good word and a very good translation of the word because it has to do with this transition. 
And we, we kind of speak that way in, in our language today as believers, that one of the, the things that happen as a believer comes to Christ and his sins are taken care of, there's a transformation in their life, there's a change. And uh, so it's a, it's a good use of the word here. And uh, it doesn't mean that Peter doesn't necessarily uh, is a follower of Christ, but in the terminology of that time, there had to be a transformation of Peter uh, to accept and to be willing. And that happened, of course, in the book of Acts, uh, where we would uh, safely say that these men were saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit. But this is pre-cross, pre and so uh, Peter's faith in Christ, because he did say that he is the Christ, who could they go? And uh, so this was a section where I think Peter had to learn that he couldn't do it on his own. And uh, there, there is the uh, weakness in his character that caused him to deny Christ. Obviously, it was fear, uh, because uh, the other disciples were, they headed to the hills. And so Peter at least followed Christ a long way, and the narrative kind of tells us that. But his disposition was that, uh, um, you know, he, he wasn't quite sure, I guess is the, the, the nicest way to say it. Um, I guess uh, Peter was showing some signs of spiritual weakness. And uh, so the Lord had told him of the impending sifting and rather than preparing for the attack of the enemy, linking back to the garden where every time Jesus turned around, they were asleep. And I guess it was a good teaching moment for them. Um, notice that it says in verse 54, so let's go back now to the narrative that we're looking at, that he... Um, he, he showed some uh, steps that I think are, that are, uh, uh, make it more understandable for us in this day, that uh, he kept his distance, verse 54, it says, and he, then uh, they took Jesus, him, and led him, and brought him to the high priest's house, and Peter was afar off. So they went to the priest's high priest's house, his personal house, and it had a center courtyard in it, and uh, those that were following the crowd that had Jesus stayed out there. And because it was chilly, they made a fire. And uh, Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire, verse 55, in the midst of the hall, uh, they, were sent, they sat down together and, and Peter sat among them. So not to make a big deal out of that, but uh, it seems that sometimes when people are drifting, they're following, but from a distance, but they have no problem officiating or uh, uh, simulating themselves with the crowd, the crowd that was against Christ. And whether Peter was just there sitting, hoping to hear or see something, or he was uh, didn't want to let go, but was afraid to get any closer. I guess that's a, um, something that we have to kind of think about, but it's most likely uh, the most telling sign uh, a fall is about to happen. Uh, times of trouble and doubt are not the same, not the time of, to follow from a distance. I find that in my life that a lot of believers struggle, and instead of running to God, they run away from God. They have a problem, next thing you know, the only reason we know is because we haven't seen them in a couple weeks, they're not in church, and you finally find out what's going on. I find that the natural course would be to run to God and because he's really the only one that can solve the problem that we have. So coming to church and being among his believers and worshiping together, I think is probably the best medicine for anyone that has had doubts or is having struggles because of life. Peter stayed for the distance and uh, stayed with this crowd. And uh, so let's think about this for a second because there's a progression in his denial. The, the warning signs were evident, and now the compromise that will lead to his denial processes uh, progresses to an, an alarming rate. There's three occasions where he has uh, uh, interaction with this, uh, these folks that are here. His association, verse 55, and when they had kindled the fire, he sat down together, and Peter sat among them. I guess if you were to be dramatic, you could probably say that the idea of sitting among them meant that he sat among them and were interacting with them. Uh, they were seeing him and his face and hearing his voice because this is what uh, began the question of who he is. Uh, 
It says a certain maid. Uh, the word can mean slave girl, uh, and that would make a lot of sense being at the high priest's house. She might have been one of the staff there. I guess that's a kind way to say it. And beheld him as he sat by the fire. Now, if you think about in Christ's public ministry, uh, they walked around Galilee and Nazareth and all these other places together, the disciples in Christ, and they were out there publicly and feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 10,000 and, and uh, Christ healing people, all these things. And then Jesus sends them out as witnesses. And so uh, these men were recognizable, I think, in society. They knew who Jesus was. They knew who his followers were, the disciples that were with him all the time. So it makes a lot of sense that this woman, uh, this girl, tries to identify him. And it says in uh, verse 56, this man was also with him. And the, 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 the language speaks of intimately being with him, follower of his, a disciple. So uh, it's pretty clear what was happening here. And uh, she, he was being set aside or recognized as one of the ones that was with Jesus who was at the high priest. And uh, so there was a link there. And uh, uh, now I can't answer why Peter denied Christ. Now Jesus said he was going to. You would think that would have been a good uh, catalyst not to. But human nature, uh, I guess it's human nature. We hear what we want to hear. And that's, I think, what was happening with Peter. Peter believed what he believed and heard what he heard. And even though Jesus warned him, uh, he didn't take much stock in it, probably thinking, well, I was ready to die with you. Why would I deny you? You know, a rational statement makes sense. Uh, but Peter couldn't see beyond his own ability. And I think this is one of the reasons for this sifting that was happening here. So you, you'll see the physical realm, and then you see the spiritual realm, where Jesus said, you know, you're going to deny me because you're a scary cat. He said, you're going to deny me because there's going to be a work in your life that Satan is going to do, and he's going to sift you. And, uh, you know, so there, there, there was something that Peter was going to lose because of the sifting. And this denial, I think, is connected with it. So we have uh, this association that he has. Uh, Peter's life, and, you know, in his life, it's, it's bad when you can't read your own writing, especially when you type it, you know, I need a proofreader sometimes, but let me get this right. It's easy for us to see or look at Peter's life and become critical because we too have made the same mistakes. Uh, you might not have necessarily said, I don't know who Jesus is, but you might have done that indirectly. I remember in high school, and I still uh, don't like the thought of it, but I had an opportunity in 11th grade to take a stand for Christ in class. The teacher asked, if you believe, your sister, if you believe, are you willing to stand before the class? And I wanted to, but I was scared of the peer pressure and all the other things. There, One girl in the class stood. She was the pastor's daughter from a church in, in um, Sweet Valley. But uh, I wanted to, and I felt bitter afterwards, and certainly confessed the sin. I felt that it was, and uh, you know, so and that's a minute thing. And maybe you probably have something that you could probably share along the same lines. When you had the opportunity to take a stand and you did not, not because you didn't want to, but because you allowed the pressure and fear of life to overtake you. I'm not giving Peter an opportunity for excuse, but certainly. Peter was uh, being de dealt with about this. Now remember, Peter was one of the three. He was being groomed to be a leader of the church. You know, so some of these things had to be dealt with because if not, then that would have caused more problems in the church, I imagine. You know, the book of Psalms is rich in the wisdom. And the first Psalm um, says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful. So when you think of Peter hunkering down by the fire um, with the crowd, uh, maybe giving him a sense of, of false security, uh, God has a way of uh, getting us uh, our attention. 
And in this case, Peter is recognized by the woman. In verse 58, it says, and after a while, you know, after that calmed down, whatever, um, another one saw him and said, uh, you know, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And, uh, you know, it, it's an emphatic sense, so he was adamant about it. I'm not with him. And uh, I have a question in my notes here that I was going to ask you. I didn't, but I'm going to come back to that. Because um, you might be thinking that, you know, in this case, in my life, there would be no chance that I would ever deny Christ. Never deny it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll always be willing to take a stand. And uh, I went through the Old Testament, of course, looking for examples. And, uh, you know, there was a, a section in the book of Job. Have you considered Lot? Asked God, or said to God from Satan. Job. You said Lot. Job. Okay, I'm getting to Job. I'm at Lot, yeah. Yeah, you're right, Mark. Thank you. I always look at her because, you know, she's my rock. <laughs> no, she's uh, she's my secretary. No, she's my wife. <laughs> His journey toward failure began with him pitched the tent at Sodom. Remember that story? Abram a lot, and Abram gave him an opportunity, and he turned his face toward Sodom. How about David? Rather than fighting in the army of the Lord, he found a seat upon the rooftop, and that cost him more than he ever wanted to pay. The dangers when we get comfortable on the world. Uh, so uh, when we think about uh, Peter and his association, it turns into a picture of apathy as well. Uh, we find the actual denials of Peter in this section here. Three times he denies he never knew the Lord, uh, which really is a blatant lie because everybody there knew who Christ was. So you have to say, well, what is he, what is he saying? He's, he's trying to uh, cut the association or the connection with Christ. Uh, because everybody knew who Jesus was. That's what we were there. He's sitting among the accusers and he seems to have an arrogance about him. Peter seems to think that he's well able to handle the situation himself. He has denied the Lord and yet remains there in his self-confidence. And so we find that uh, there's, uh, in verse 60, his abandonment. Look at verse 60. Um, well, let me read 59 for the second uh, event. In about the space of an hour, uh, after another confidently affirmed saying of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he's a Galilean. So I guess if you wanted to do some research to find the significance of the, why they picked him out, I found that uh, depending on the region, there was a, a special type of cloth or design. You go to Scotland, and they have... Uh, Tarragons, not tarragons, but uh, different patterns for their uh, their clothing, uh, so different types of designs, and it shows you from this part of Scotland, this part of Scotland. So it's not something new, uh, and that might have been it. Could have been also his uh, accent, uh, his Galilean accent as well. Um, but yeah. well, regardless of how you think about it, he was a recognizable man. And Peter said, "I don't know what you're saying." And immediately, while he yet spoke, the cock crew, uh, the rooster crowed, I guess, is the best way to look at it from our vernacular, um, as he was still speaking. So that, for effect, really brought back his memory of what Christ had said. And it says in verse 61, and the Lord turned and looked upon him. So now we have a kind of a, a contextual geographical picture. So say he's in this room as the center or the courtyard with no roof, and then there's a, a balcony above or a big room. And so there was a, a way for him to see Christ. And it says, the passage says that the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crew, thou shalt deny me three times. And so we have the, uh, the pain of his denial. This is almost the end, I think. Yep. Um, I had another um, point on there, but I decided that, that it wasn't necessary. But the pain of denial. So, you know, a lot of times we focus on this person, that person, the event. And so there's uh, 
multiple opportunities to look at how we see this section. Um, it's not necessarily just about Peter, even though it is about Peter. We see the Lord's response as well, and the Lord's hope. The statement that Jesus said that, uh, you know, that he's praying for Peter, that his faith remains, and that in this transformation, you know, uh, when, he, when he wakes up spiritually, uh, things will be better for him. And in this section, we have this revelation, verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon him. I've said this already. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. And I think it's significant for us sometimes that as we uh, embrace our Christian uh, values and we uh, take a stand on theology, that there's a necessary part of our understanding of the word of God as his very word to us, the Logos. And so... Uh, even though we're reading about something that happened thousands of years ago, this section is for us as well. There's application for us as believers because there seemingly is a potential uh, area that could happen in our lives where we find ourselves on the same boat as Peter. Now, Peter's response, I think, is correct. Uh, that's always a good sign of true repentance when it causes sorrow. Peter uh, says, and it says in verse 62, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. And, uh, and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. I was thinking about this this morning, that if I had the chance, would I rather have physical pain or emotional pain? And it seems like physical pain is easier to deal with. Emotional pain... Uh, seems to linger longer. I don't know if you've ever had anybody turn on you or stab you in the back, however you want to phrase it. Someone close to you, someone you've helped, someone that you've uh, tried to uh, lead to Christ or to encourage. And the ministry happens a lot of times. That's why in Bible college, I remember the professors used to say, if you don't have thick skin, go find another job. You know, And uh, it's true that when you start to help people uh, and lead them uh, spiritually, and physically, sometimes uh, things happen. And uh, uh, so I don't take anything away from this narrative as far as Peter's denial, but I sometimes reflect on the significance of Christ uh, knowing all of this going to happen. Uh, I, I'm almost positive you could make the case that Peter and James and John were very, very cro close to Christ and, and uh, loved him dearly. And Jesus loved them. And their pres his presence affected them. And yet we find that uh, even though Peter is in this position uh, of seemingly in a place where failure could not happen, it happened anyway. So uh, the pain of denial is there. The revelation we've read. Uh, the remembrance of verse 61 where Peter remembers the very words. The benefit of knowing God's word and studying it and memorizing it will help us along the way. Uh, only the uh, certain ones, Pentecostals and others, claim that they have connections and God speaks to them verbally and people claim all sorts of, I think, unbiblical things. Maybe to encourage other people, maybe in their own minds they think this, but the only thing I find in that's a reality is that God has given us his word. So he speaks to us through his word. And you might be thinking, well, this is kind of difficult because it's kind of hard to understand. And, you know, it's so far along ago. And how does this apply? But remember that when we were saved, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's ministry is to help us to know his will. But there has to be a willingness on our part to obey his word as the revelation is revealed to us. Just like Paul talks about babes in Christ who should be eating meat but are still having milk, you know, because they cannot digest the difficulties of the Word of God. So that responsibility falls on us. It has nothing to do with education or your intelligence. It has a lot to do with a willingness to submit to the Word of God and allow the Word of God to have its way. And the only way to really demonstrate that is by through obedience. And, uh, you know, not just a willingness to do it, but the actual obedience of the word of God. And Peter learns this because he finds out that he is not capable of handling uh, the difficulties in life and reverts back to what 
Most people would say that most of us have as a survival instinct, fight or flight. And uh, the other disciples did the flight part, and Peter was the one with the sword, but is still lingering, but eventually he'll be on his way as well. Uh, we have uh, the regret that Peter suffers. So this section really kind of focuses, and it's all kind of meld into one, that Peter's recognition of his sin, the remembrance of the word of God, and then the regret. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter didn't just shed an emotional tear, he wept bitterly, then sobbing violently and uncontrollably. He realized the magnitude of his failure. At a time when he should have remained close to the Lord, supporting him in prayer, Peter had found a seat among those who sought his life and denied him. When he began to deal with it, with his failure, it brought great sorrow. I hope that happens to you sometimes when you find yourself out of God's will, that it brings you to tears because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross for us, his love for us. Uh, we sometimes lose that because of his deity, but uh, Jesus felt every pain that we could ever feel, emotionally and physically. And uh, until you can understand and apply it in your lives, you'll always be like Peter, in the distance, following Christ. My goal is to get as close as I can until I'm there with them. It has nothing to do with spiritual perfection. It has nothing to do really anything about me. It has a lot to do with the Lord and my willingness to uh, surrender to him. What Peter did was wrong. The fact that he was convicted confirmed his relationship with the Lord, Hebrews 12, 6. I turn that to that passage a lot of times with people that I've talked to over the years. And uh, matter of fact, you know, remember John, the blind guy? He calls me every week now. Really? I'm back on his link, you know. <laughs> and I'm willing to answer. His, they're always the same. But he asked me, is it wrong? And I said, if you feel it's wrong, it's wrong to you, John. You know, and he doesn't listen. Obviously, he has all sorts of mental problems. But um, that's kind of how we're, most people are. You know, they question it. My opinion is if you think it's sin, it probably is for you. And uh, the Bible tells us that if you think it's sin in your life, it is sin. You know, so uh, it's not a thing that you look around and see what other people are doing. It's something that we have to really examine ourselves as well. I'm sure that we all have, have been like Peter in the past, whether you want to admit it or not. Uh, but uh, the good thing is, though, there's restoration and forgiveness. And uh, sometimes, even as believers, we have to get on our knees and cry out to God and say, Lord, forgive me and uh, you know, restore me. And obviously, he does. He forgives us and cleanses us. And so it's a, it's a, it's a nice thing to uh, really kind of uh, end the day with, with forgiveness. I jotted this down. I wanted to give it to you as a um, just a, something to think about. I'm not sure if I'm going to this Sunday because I think it would lead into something else. But uh, yeah, there was one thing I wanted to leave you with, and I think I might have shared this with you years ago or somewhere in my past. I read this about uh, the. The insensitivity of recognition of sin. And the guy was from Alaska. I think their, the, the missionary name was Blood. And his, uh, one of their sons was in my class in college. He was a very unique guy. The first two semesters, he struggled with getting in class on time. In Alaska, there's no such thing as on time. You get there when you get there. And uh, it makes quite a struggle for a church. You know, a church is at 11 and you show up at 11.30 thinking you're on time. And in this case, though, he was given the example how the Eskimos would kill wolves. They would take a very sharp knife, and then they would freeze uh, animal blood on it uh, over the blade, and then they would set it in a, in a set like you would do for um, uh, trapping. And the wolf would lick the blood, and as he's licking it, his tongue becomes numb of the coldness, and that doesn't realize that it cuts its own tongue off or something along those lines. I, I, when I heard the last part, I kind of, uh, I'm not sure if that's an illustration, but it is because that there's no sensitivity to it. And uh, gradual sin does that to you until the fall happens. And so we need to safeguard ourselves, making sure that we're, our minds and our, our thoughts are always 
kind of cloistered into the Word of God, allowing the Word of God to have His way. So let's let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this time. Uh, it's a narrative that doesn't necessarily uh, thrill us as we look at someone else's failure, but as we continue to read Your Word, we find out that Peter has a, a, a restoration and uh, has been used greatly in the church. So we're thankful for that. We're thankful because. We know that if Peter was forgiven, we can be as all, well as well also. So we're thankful for that. We pray, Father, for this week that uh, you would give us opportunities to encourage other people, uh, share the gospel with someone, Father, and we're thankful for all that you allow us to uh, be able to be involved in. And we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, sing a hymn together. Trusting Jesus, let's stand together and sing this hymn.
Thank you.